Welcome, everyone, to the Wild Isle podcast. I have with me Josh Phillips. Hello. <laughs> Uh, um, Josh is someone I've known as, uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this. Um, I think of you as the math philosopher specifically, uh, <laughs> but, uh, there's actually, it's funny. You're, uh, one of two people who have, um, expressed, uh, an, either an interest or speciality in, um, some math re related field in philosophy. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Not necessarily the math part though. We very well may be getting to that, but, um, I expect we'll have a decent philosophical discussion. But before we do, uh, I just want to show my other products out here on the internet. Um, so if you are interested in looking for an editor, you can go over to wildislelit.com. I do uh, editing services, proofreading, line editing, developmental editing. I can even do this for essays. If you're a student and you need an essay proofread before you're going to turn it in because it's full of grammatical holes and terrible syntax or you don't even know if you've ever learned to read in your life. Uh, also, I write fiction. Uh, I've got one novel out now and about to release a uh, short story collection. So if you look up uh, Wand Smoke Broken on my website or on Amazon, you can find it there. Um, let's see. Lastly, you can find this podcast also on my website or on YouTube. Um, so my website, again, is wildislelit.com. All right. Now, I've done enough shilling. Um, so... You know, I've just characterized you as like the math philosopher. Uh, how accurate do you think that is, Josh? I, I've joked before that I'm like very underread on everything. And so like I get the awkward bit where I can talk about stuff with no citations, no it, the sort of joke that you have these, you know, very long works of philosophy. And in fact, the spark notes are about half of the value most people will get out of them. So I end up in that awkward spot where, like, I know a bunch, but not super well. Mm. So you're su are you suggesting, like, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is logic? Like, you actually learn th the same type of philosophical or even uh, Socratic logic in a, a lot of mathematics courses, right? As you yeah. Would. Yeah, like, the, the most classic one that comes up, not to get too technical, is, like, um, all squares are rectangles but not all rectangles are squares in this case all the squares fit inside the concept of being a rectangle like that's a pattern that shows up in a bunch of places because there can be a subset of anything in theory yeah and if you're not familiar listeners it's uh, essentially um a socratic syllogism if i'm not mistaken right it, using uh what are the typical words like some all you know if yeah. x then y um now i had an interesting thought when you're bringing that up have you ever had a conversation with someone who had a hard time squaring the rectangle <laughs> to, to, to use that word so what i mean by that is um because I, I actually I, i'd like to broach this to a larger conversation about philosophy and its impacts mm -hmm. on communication but before we get there we'll stick with our example um someone who has an issue with the divide between all and some uh or with the let's say direction of logic for instance the other classic example uh we could use if you know the example with raining like if i'm out say if i'm outside and it's raining, I get wet, mm -hmm. um, like, I'm out, uh, it's raining, um, like, therefore, I, I'm wet, or something like that. I can't remember the exact example uh, live here, but I'm sure you've heard it before, yeah. where where it's set up to where it sounds like the person should be wet, but it, the conditions that preset them getting wet uh, yeah. have not actually been met. Yeah, so it's, it's something like... Um, if I'm outside and it's raining, then I will get wet. I'm outside and it's raining, so I will get wet. And the the thing that gets people is splitting the fact that the logic of that statement is valid. It's not a sound reasoning because, of course, you could have an umbrella. There, there's. It's clearly not the case that that first premise, if I'm outside and it's raining, then I will. The that first premise is not true because you could be living in a bubble. And yeah, they've, so, been, they've built uh, their argument on a false premise. And, yeah, and if if you haven't heard this before, listeners, uh, you certainly will for me 
beyond this point is if you start with a false premise, you can get just about anywhere. Literally anywhere, depending on like the the, the more formal it is, the more obvious it is. Um, you've probably seen like YouTube videos joking about one equals zero proofs. At any of some point. I have not. Tell me. Yeah. That. So like one of the things that tends to get skipped over in like school is when we do algebra. There's a lot of operations that are allowed and other ones that aren't allowed. And generally, you don't get taught very clearly why. And it's because the ones that are allowed, in this case, keep the equation equal. And the ones that aren't allowed somehow mess up the equation being equal. So the idea is like, um, there are a lot of different tricks with like dividing by zero or squaring a number, then taking the square root, where you can mess with an equation and make 1 equal 0 pop out. And you can sort of Google this. It's very easy to find examples of people doing it. In fact, a lot of math teachers, like college level, they'll show it and they'll be like, can you find what's wrong with this? Because you should be able to find it. They're not like... Everything they're writing is correct, except that one of the steps isn't acceptable mathematically like if you say um you'll do something like x equals y and then at some point you're dividing by x minus y which is zero but of course you're obscuring the fact that, that operation isn't legal and yeah so yeah if you have one equals zero well, you can make any two numbers equal each other because you can replace any one with a zero vice versa yeah it kind of destroys um if I if I switch over to a uh, a Taoist gear, it destroys the fundamental balance balance of reality. You've taken say uh, they would describe our universe as being dualistic, mm -hmm. and so like one thing being creates its opposite, and their opposition was what creates the whole of being itself. And if you were to eliminate the opposition, the difference, the exclusivity between the two, mm -hmm. you eliminate things. Yeah, because there's no way to, that one thing is different from another thing. So what is a right. what is a thing then, right? You you start to lose the uh, the essence of any uh, object, if you will. Yeah, it's like in the in the math example, right? I think uh, Rick and Morty, the TV show, did a gag of this where he hacks their equivalent of like the Galactic Fed and makes one dollar equal zero dollars, <laughs> and their whole economy explodes because. Suddenly, your salary means nothing, and it it's that kind of joke that you know any math system or logic system you can make an argument that it's somewhat arbitrary, but inevitably you have to pick logic rules that don't explode like that because it'd be very hard to conveniently partition all the exploding if it was in the system, yeah um. Because, like, you could say, we can only do these very specific things with the logic. It's like, well, we should probably just get rid of the problem in our math. Or, um, I remember that from sixth grade, where it's like, there's a bunch of math tricks that work, but they don't work for all numbers. Like, just these random... Yeah, they're, they're not really rules. They are happenstance coincidences that look like rules. Yeah. That if you treat like rules will fail you at a key moment when you really yeah. need them not to. It's like when you're told when you're very young, like you can't subtract bigger numbers from smaller numbers, which is true in the context of first grade where we're sort of pretending zero's the real bottom and we're not including the idea of the numbers going in both directions. And stuff. Yeah. We just say, no, no, the bigger number's always on top while we're subtracting because... We're hoping by fifth grade you'll be able to handle this getting a little bit weirder. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump back into that because, you know, the reason that that, that is done is because it's assumed that the first grader cannot understand, like, negative integers right. at that stage. And that very well may be the case for the development of children. Um, developmental psychology is not my absolute specialty, so I don't know. But let's assume that it is. But I asked a question before, and it's like, what do you do or have you ever, is a better uh, starting point, have you ever run into someone where or with whom they have a tenuous grasp of let's say um one of a few things one of them might be uh 
being able to categorize things as subcategories of other things mm -hmm. or uh, uh, the example i use with this is like you know you could have boxes in boxes mm -hmm. and then you have separate boxes with other boxes in those boxes and right. those are like concepts and then like sub concepts that contain them and then sometimes sometimes yeah, it just kind of breaks the metaphor but the boxes like intersect a little bit right. but not entirely where there are hard boundaries in certain places and mm -hmm. subcategories and they, they can't grasp that and they either uh usually what i run into is they flatten across like there are no boxes in boxes mm -hmm. there are only multitudes of boxes and therefore you can slide between them so that's one thing so i guess yeah. that would be is um what would you call that? I don't know if that's a, a break in the logic or if that um, would be a, a, a false premise uh, problem or um, someone who can't follow, right? Like they they essentially set up non sequiturs and like there's no mm -hmm. no way to get them to see that the thing that they're saying follows no matter how much intuitively right. it feels like it does. It doesn't. So have you run it? I'm sure you run into people where either of these problems are the case. I think this is what you mean. The one I joke about is in terms of like explaining like social custom stuff, people aren't cognizant that a lot of it is at least partially arbitrary. So they just say, you gotta. And that's all, like, they, they don't even know that they're not explaining it. They just keep saying, you got to do this. And But, like, yeah, the seems... specific concept one, like, I think I bump into a lot more people either not being able to engage with it as a logic thing, or, like, they have some holistic sense of how something works. And they're very resistant to anything but holistic ideas adjacent to where they are. Um, as an example, like a lot of like the exercise physiology stuff, which I read a lot about, <laughs> not that I know that much. Like people will believe things like it's better to use less weight. And they have that idea in their head. And they won't necessarily be comfortable with any investigation of what that idea means. So if you say, like, what well, does that mean if I use the lightest weight I could find for the most reps like I could do in a day, I would be the biggest dude in the gym. And they're just, like, very uncomfortable with that question because, like, they haven't thought about what their idea means. And yeah. In practice, it is some doctor told a 60-year-old, please stop hurting your back trying yeah. to pick up a 100-pound thing that you haven't touched in five years. Yeah, and the, the philosophical issue there might be with the definition of the word better. Yeah. Uh, I see this with need quite a lot, yeah. where there are certain words that by their nature are relative. Better for what? Yeah. Like what? Because the word better by itself actually doesn't mean anything. Right. You had has to reference something else. And so... Uh, I call this gray think, where mm -hmm. um, essentially, I don't know if I've told you this before, but I think that when we're thinking in our head, mm -hmm. it's it's exactly like when we're dreaming. Now, when we're dreaming, things don't need to actually make sense or cohere or follow. Right. Everything feels like it works. Right. And the, the plot, the potholes are just filled right. and it just goes. <laughs> things don't have to be true. That like no, no, There is no fundamental reality. So what I think is that when we're thinking, the same thing is happening while it's in our heads. It's only once we are forced to articulate it out. Mm -hmm. That that exact point where you pointed out that someone might get uncomfortable. Yeah. That all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't follow. Right. And you get that dreaded, or they get in this case, get that dreaded feeling of I made a mistake. I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, and if they've tied, let's say, their uh identity and value as a person to their let's say skill set and their maybe they got an undergraduate degree in exercise phys physiology yeah. which i'm not bashing them because i got an undergraduate <laughs> degree in exercise physiology for as much as i use it um but the point there being like the the sudden neg let's say upwelling of negative emotion causes them to immediately uh shut down uh, perhaps even in the sense that they might become 
incapable of whatever degree of reasoning that they were capable of mm-hmm. uh, about, uh, capable of just that moment before. Um, have you ever been like able to pull someone back from the brink once you put them there? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, it's it's a it's a very marginal thing, right? Like if you're talking to somebody who like they realize you caught some gap in their knowledge. Well, depending on their mindset and any number of other things, they might go, oh, I don't know. Like, I was missing some detail of how this stuff works. Um, I know it's exercise is stuff, but, like, I've had so many people who've never lifted tell me I have to get a lifting belt or I'll get hurt. And I and I just respond every time, like, you do know I would just be using more weight if the belt was helping me lift more, right? And And, like, there's a split. A lot of them go, oh... And, like, I can tell that they're like, oh, wait a second. Like, it, because in this particular case, right, a boat would make you safer doing a very specific thing. It won't necessarily work chronically if it lets you use more weight or it makes you more overconfident, etc. Yeah, if it uh, staunches the development of your core and uh, in terms right. of uh, not just strength, but coordination with the rest of your yeah. body. Yeah, there's all kind of problems. Um I have an aphorism. I don't, did I tell you I write aphorisms? I started doing no. this. Yeah, I've got a bunch. It's in a hidden part of my website. So mm-hmm. for those listening, you can find the secret wall of aphorisms. Um, wildiolit.com slash wall hyphen of hyphen quotes. If you put that in, I link it all the time. So it's not actually a secret. But if you go to my website, I don't, I, I purposely didn't put a direct link to it because I, I write spicy things on there and I yeah. wanted to, if I was being investigated purposefully, they're going to go to the website and they're probably not going to listen all the way to this podcast. So hopefully I'm safe. YouTube, don't kill me. Um, yeah. So I wrote one called short and narrow vision and, um, very much in the kind of biting Nietzschean style. Uh, I, I can actually read it out here. Let me see if I can, uh, find it. Yeah. I'll zoom out because. Short and narrow. Yeah, here it is. Short and narrow vision. It is the mark of the weak and lethargic to never see their own ideas all the way through. Mm -hmm. And the criticism there, and you can tell me if you think this is valid. Uh, Actually, I'll ask you, what do you think? um, Why am I calling them weak and lethargic? What do you think? Uh, So I, I would guess it's like ideas that are stated very universally but in practice people believe them for very particular cases like the one i recall which is political but is like people will say something like education is valuable so it should be free it's like are you saying that things that are valuable should be free yeah because so, so why am I calling that person? Because I would, I'd call that person yeah. weak and lethargic specifically. So they're mm-hmm. lacking in strength and lazy. I mean, it's definitely like the sort of error of not checking whether an idea actually works. Yeah, that would be That's the lethargy part, part yeah. right? Why weak? I don't know why weak. Why weak? Right, so here's my. This is dipping a little bit into psychology because uh, I've. I read too much Yoon. Um, but my, I have this, uh, actually, Yoon had this idea that your ego is actually kind of like a muscle and that um, what it lifts is painful experiences, right? So you can think about getting like a thick skin as you put yourself in front of the crowd, as you get criticized. Mm-hmm. Um, if you know how to take it well, eventually you can take more and more and it doesn't bother you as much. Um, the same thing might be true with your own errors, right? Like if you, have made mistakes in the past and you look at the mistake it sucks that you made it it sucks to recognize that you made it then you go back and fix it after you've done that a few times it gets a little bit easier a little bit easier a little bit easier well my suspicion is that most people almost never when it comes to anything conceptual or abstract ever 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 check their mistakes because it feels bad to do Mm. it it feels bad to recognize that you did you said something and you thought you knew what you were saying and you didn't know mm-hmm. and in fact you were incredibly wrong and it looks really foolish on the face of it and that's mm-hmm. true for almost everything that comes out of your mouth yeah and then that means who you think you are you're probably not nearly as intelligent or competent like it it digs a hole mm-hmm. way down into the person's self esteem and just like drops them into hell and so it's like why would you do that <laughs> right 
So, but that's why. Uh, what do you think? Do you think I'm being a little too harsh? Reminds me of, um, I, re- I think it's an old SMBC comic of like a bachelor's degree makes you think you know almost everything. Hmm. A master's degree makes you really sure that you know a ton about one thing. And a PhD just makes you go, oh, God, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. It's the, the sort of, the more you look, the more inconvenient and complicated most things tend to get. Like, if you try to do, like, fitness stuff, it's like, the first bit that's, like, 80% of the health benefit is easy. And it's like, don't eat junk food like I do, and walk more. And, like, that is a shockingly high amount of the health benefit in terms of how long till you die that seems to be achievable via, like, you know, non-medical stuff. If they upload us to the Matrix, this kind of stops being true. But then, like, you could literally try to learn forever how to squeeze the next, like, 20% of that stone. You get a PhD just in trying to live forever, and you'd be like, oh, God, we don't know, like, a lot of things and how much they really matter. Yeah, and then what happens when you find out that depending on various, like, genetic predispositions as complicated as that gets right because it's not like we're homogenous tribes anymore who stay in one area so so it's like you've got a a slurry of genetic inputs right you don't really exactly know which ones like you even if we like mapped your freaking uh individual like genome it's like we don't know what the genes mean like like phenotypic expression so then you you see this problem with diet too where it seems like you know some like one dietary habit would make someone flourish and make someone else like an unhealthy oh. slag on the ground. Now, obviously there are some diets that will do that to everyone, right? There's something yeah. like, you can't just eat uh, arsenic for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and think you're going to live. Uh, yeah. Probably can't do that. With, well, I, It'll be I, trending by next week. Uh, now, sure. The arsenic. So Remember that, the tapeworm thing? No, tell me about the tapeworm thing. At some point in, like, the 50s, there really was a tapeworm-based diet theory where they were selling tapeworm eggs to people. I knew they were selling the tapeworm eggs as diet loss because yeah. you get the tapeworm and then all of a sudden you start losing all this weight because yes. it's sucking out all the nutrients from your body. Yeah. Um, it does work, um, technically. Yeah, it, it's just a question. This is where the word better, as you said earlier. It's like, it is, it is, in fact, a very efficient way to lose weight quickly. Yeah. It's also probably not generally a good choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Better, better in need is another is one that I I come across. Do you come across need a lot where people use the word need in order to uh, I call it by the back door. So what they've done is yeah. they've snuck in their own desire, yeah. hidden it from themselves by packaging it with need and then presenting it to you. So it's like I want you to do X. Because I would rather you do X in the more idyllic X world for me. So yeah. therefore, you need to do it. But they obviously haven't articulated that. It just, it just yeah. skips. You need to, like... I mean, like, politically, right, it comes up a bunch. And it's tricky because... And, and sort of setting aside the, like, effectiveness of, right, socializing particular things to fund them. Setting aside that sort of debate. Like, there's often complicated issues of, like, what's the standard of living you're like targeting and what are you trading off to fund things? Um, like an example that I think separates the people who are very abstract from the population is when uh, Peter Singer, the ethicist wrote about not liking the Make-A-Wish Foundation because they spend a bunch of money on like very sort of theatrical gifts for very sick children who like obviously those children like deserve to have a nice life in a certain sense, but he's like, why would you fund that when you could fund malaria nets in Africa or like nutrition interventions in India or lots of things that would most likely save a lot more children, but they're not nearly as like exciting enough. Yeah, I guess it would depend on something like values. Yeah. And this is a conversation I had recently um which did unfortunately 
myself and the other participant didn't have time for. Mm. But it's like need is necessarily relative. What is it relative to? It's predicated on what is valued. Yeah. And in this particular case, like, well, the Make a Wish Foundation very clearly perhaps values um, the individual experience of a particular set of children as opposed to like the broad net of right right because it's like they're not targeting everyone they could possibly help they're saying we value you know giving some you know good experience to someone who's been stricken by fate right so they they value let's say counterbalancing misfortune uh delivered in a particular manner and then the you know what would the critique be right? Uh, this is I think what I, I I was trying to get at that I hate or one of the things I hate a lot of oh. things I shouldn't uh, hate so much but um, is that there's a presumption that no 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 my values are let's say not just mine they are somehow uh, written into fate. There's like mm-hmm. a, a misplacement of the subjective valuation of things with like that i don't don't even know what the hell you would you would be unless one is like projecting himself onto the universe right like that's what it seems like someone's doing when they're assuming their values are universal yeah there's the old the old sart sart uh, i can't pronounce his name um sart yeah yeah um i think the famous quote from him was like when you make a decision you're saying that everyone in the same situation should make the same decision. And of course, there's a ton of play there with what the word same means and whatever the exact wording he used, but that, like, in principle, it seems like you should do things that you could justify as opposed to the alternatives. So that if someone was in a sufficiently similar situation, you would, in theory, be telling them to do the same but, but a better version of this example, so I'm not, like, just being mean to the Make-A-Wish Foundation, <laughs> is, like, imagine you were on vacation, like, overseas, where, like, you have no sort of personal investment. It's not like, you know, your grandparents are from this country or something like that. And, like, there's a fundraiser for the local, like, soccer kids team. Well, it'd be kind of weird to give them 50 bucks instead of giving the, like malaria net foundation 50 bucks because you don't know either of these people so if you're giving away money it seems odd to pick something that's not going to do that much versus malaria nets to save people is like the sort of that example hopefully has gone out of date because it's been funded for a while yeah um because that's kind of the distinction between like you know why would i give like my nephew 30 bucks for his birthday because that's family and community and it's like well i think part of this issue is that we are thinking from like a post enlightenment abstract perspective Mm -hmm. but human beings are actually like monkeys uh so we're not we're not the proposed you know disembodied uh floating heads um out of the enlightenment and that there is no such thing as not having a personal investment right right? like the the idea that you can't and so when you have that person who's going to give to the local soccer he's like does he like soccer right does he value soccer and he wants other children to enjoy soccer and like yeah he could donate to the malaria thing but he could donate to a bajillion things in his lifetime there's like no limit right. to the number of things and it's like what matters uh what matters to him right in, in principle it reminds me uh, have you ever i've actually never played it but i watched the whole playthrough of um the last of us the very first one i don't think i ever touched it i mean i know the very yeah. rough plot concept. I'm going to spoil it. Yeah. Uh, so get, I don't know if that's all right. That game's like 10 years old. Yeah, yeah it's super old now. And uh, so at the very end of the game, you spend the whole game getting this girl to this uh, group. Um, I can't remember what they're called, but they are trying to find a cure to the uh, essentially cordyceps virus that's yeah. taken over. The zombie moment. thing. Yeah, the zombie cordyceps The zombie virus. plot elements. Yes. Uh, and it, it turns out that uh, so at the very beginning of the game, your uh, protagonist, Joel, he's got a daughter. She gets killed in the prologue. And this uh, other girl they're getting there is kind of like a surrogate daughter. And, you know, through the whole game, it's very cinematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kind of build this father-daughter relationship between them. And when you get there, you find out that uh, in order to 
maybe derive this cure, they're going to have to um, like dissect her brain. So she's okay. going to be killed in the process. And there's something that happened. It was really interesting watching the whole playthrough because it's like watching a series of movies because the game is really long. And you can become very attached. You become personally invested to the characters. Um, you, or at least I, and I've never met anyone who has seen this and not felt the exact same thing, which is it, would, it shows that the writing was really well done. You don't give you give zero fucks mm -hmm. about the world mm -hmm. in this scenario, and it's like the right thing to do is to save her from being killed. And I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like let the rest of the. And I think um, there's a very 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 human element there that gets lost. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why I bring up that example is because it like yeah you've mentioned before in our discussions off microphone I guess yeah. um, that all moral systems like the biggest issue is that they have to be able to convince you why you care about them right and i think if that's touching on that like there's a point where it's like no 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 that matters like if it's your daughter who they're going to kill you do not care and if it was somebody and then experiencing that second hand through the game is like if someone said that to me like it's my kid i don't right. care i'm i'm i know it's like okay that's right mm -hmm. now i even if i have to oppose you because maybe i'm one of the people who get killed mm -hmm. as a result of you know whatever stupid hypothetical i've come up with but there's this kind of um uh, let's say i don't know i don't know exactly what to call it but i think that touches on something important about the failures to attempt to universalize mm -hmm. um, a lot of these concepts in fact the universe to universalize very well may be making that very effort where we've just talked about where people use the word need or they use the word better, mm -hmm. they use relativistic terms without actually being relative to any reality. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? There's a lot of, I think I'm following it that like one of the super common errors is like assuming there aren't scarcity or trade-off problems, especially in like sort of absurdly extreme ways, like, you have, like, the Star Trek fantasy where, like, you know, Star Trek, they're, like, fairly socialistic the way the, you know, human empire, mostly human empire, seems to work, is very egalitarian. And, like, it's kind of tricky watching it, though, because they don't have to engage with, like, how this is working and, like, the question of whether that can work economically. They conveniently have post-scarcity so that, like, if you hate the Klingons, you're kind of an asshole because there's plenty of stuff for everybody. And there seems to be an infinite number of planets to go colonize if you don't like the Federation. This sort of... Yeah. So, like, there really isn't that kind of a trade-off day-to-day because there's just enough of everything. And Yeah, and that doesn't even touch on the immaterial trade-offs because I think, like, again, this is post-enlightenment where we think, especially because we're super secular, like, mm -hmm. I know, I, I've never actually even asked you. I know I'm, I'm fairly... A fairly atheistic mm -hmm. uh in my yeah. outlook not religious at all um however one thing i've run into you know coming out of the new atheist movement when i was younger mm -hmm. is this utter unrecognition that again human beings are monkeys and we value things and some mm -hmm. of those things that we value aren't stuff right. like they're like particular relationships or um hierarchical status yeah hierarchical arrangements yeah. uh legacies narrative stories right. like things that aren't but like if you say like, well, that's just not real. It's just an abstraction that won't stop someone from killing you for status, right? <laughs> right. If you're out like the yeah. streets of LA, like it's, well, it's like, I, and I, I wish I had like the citation offhand. I remember the story that was an interesting one like this that was like just anecdotal cases of people who got evacuated to the U.S. as refugees. Like I think it might have been like Iraq War era, and like. Just one of the random things the researcher noted was, you know, after a few years, after like the increase in quality of life and being in a, you know, relatively much safer place, like after a few years, you still get people who are like, oh, my cell phone doesn't charge fast enough. Or like, you know, there's like too much music being played in cars going by my house. Like we're right. We're not abstractly sort of happy. It's very related to a bunch of relative stuff and most people would be 
like ha- actually a weird fitness example that I think explains this perfectly. I've had multiple people that I was like trying to talk out of doing steroids, and my basic explanation to be clear, I'm not an expert on any of that stuff, right? But my basic explanation was if you're, you know, a normal person, you're comparing yourself to some dude who's just genetically gifted and way bigger than you and probably trains harder and eats better. If you start doing drugs, you're going to compare yourself to Arnold Schwarzenegger at his peak because now you can't subconsciously exclude that group of people from your comparison. Whereas, like, you know, I look at NFL players, like, well, they have a full-time cook, they've got a full-time doctor, they've got a full-time trainer. Their job is to be in good shape. So, like, it doesn't hurt my self-esteem if they look better than me. Yeah, if they were born to a different time and place right. and of a different body, right. like, they're, they're just not the same person. Right. And it's, yeah, that's very... uh uh, it's very Jordan Peterson esque. Uh, what does it compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to so, yeah. who someone else is today? It'd be way more frustrated if somebody just showed up and then three months later they were like stronger than you. And it's just like some random dude just be like, oh God, like why am I working? <laughs> yeah. Because that would hurt if like they're not a pro athlete or whatever. Um, yeah, I feel that way about uh, I, I have this problem with comparing myself to other authors. And it's really funny because I'll even compare myself to authors who during their entire lifetime mm-hmm. no one thought was worth anything it was only after they yeah. died so i'm sitting here like oh wait a minute i'm still alive and i right. like shit and it's like well lovecraft no one even cared right about him until i don't really, i don't even know how long it was until after he died before people started picking right. his stuff up i mean van gogh's the archetype art yeah. painting obviously like it's like the archetypal thing where it had all these issues and i think killed himself I forget. I like, thought he uh, he got ill and died. Yeah, I, f- I forget like the sort of exact. Had like very bad life, and then eventually everyone came to the idea that all this stuff was really great. And it's like that's a very weird. It's like a very archetypal thing that gets sort of used a bunch narratively. And there's a Doctor Who bit where they let Van Gogh see his own museum. <laughs> like, wouldn't that kind of undercut the story if you like knew that he found out he was like. A good artist, as it were. Yeah, the the narrative it it, it kind of would uh, a bit. So it had a, I've had a couple thoughts here. Um, I'm gonna round the conversation back to yeah. mathematics and philosophy because yeah. there's and communication. We'll, we'll tie it back into communication. I'm sure it'll just go there naturally. Mm-hmm. So we have we discussed logic and we discussed its relationship with like mathematics mm-hmm. and how that is how for instance you come into philosophy i'm actually really bad at math like i'm really terrible <laughs> uh-huh. uh now that might be because of the approach like every math teacher with a modern math textbook yeah. just says like shows an example does a problem in front of you and says i do math now you do math monkey and it's like i what and I, I, I right. badly with that. So maybe I, I got like a hundred year old textbook. Also, you all... might just be bad at arithmetic and like not know. Think of it like if somebody said they're bad at sports, mm, yeah, then sure. you ask like what sports they had tried. And it was all like very like like all the sports were like throwing sports because they just lived in like an area where like shot put javelin and like baseball were the three sports, like some made up area. Like they might not realize they're good at distance running, or like yeah, there's definitely a possibility. It's a particular part of mathematics that I'm poor at. Yeah. Um, but I excelled in language. Now, this is a little bit tenuous because mm-hmm. something I've observed, um, and I think this is why Nietzsche said like poets lie too much. Uh, but people who are good with language sometimes are very good at lying to themselves and other people and make their sophist essentially if you don't know what a sophist is it's mm-hmm. someone who constructs uh, logical fallacies that are very convincing but um you know they, they don't follow or they have a false premise mm-hmm. so those two errors we talked about before anyway i thought it was interesting that uh the, you could have these two different interests because certainly language mm-hmm. and how it's constructed and the reason why the uh, reason why sentences are constructed a certain way and that grammar is a certain way and we use punctuation a certain way. Those are my, let's say, natural inclinations, interests, and uh, let's say, uh, you know, talents. Mm-hmm. And that let me 
into philosophy. Mm. Luckily, because I could have very easily gone down the the sophist path, I guess. But why is it? Do you, you know? You would think it would be the math. Like mm-hmm. math is logic. So why mm-hmm. why is it that language as well often pulls people in? Is it a common? Yeah, because yeah. like like philosophy, like I think my interest is probably the sort of interest where like. You're good at math, and there's probably there's probably some psychological bias of like I'm trying to get too much of a tangent here. How good your brain is at using abstractions, specifically, um, like I do these like math puzzles, and one of the things that's tricky is like if you like math tutoring kids, some kids can't not treat the puzzle as a real-life puzzle. So if you have this scenario where it's like, we're trying to get a bunch of stuff across the river with a very mathematically limited boat that can only hold two things at a time, well, there's kids who can go, okay, it's a math puzzle, so I'm supposed to solve it as a math puzzle. And then there's the kids who can't stop trying to, like, what if we got a second boat? What if I had somebody attach pontoons to the boat? Like, you realize they can't think of it as an abstract puzzle. It's really boring if the puzzle is, I have these dots, and here's a line on the paper. And That's a really interesting problem, though, because (laughs) in one sense, like the ability to abstract is incredibly useful. Right. But also, in another sense, if you were actually in that situation, the lack of abstraction is probably more useful because you don't get stuck in a... Your preconception of what you can do with the boat, right? Yeah. So uh, that's super interesting. So, like... So I think I got into the philosophy stuff more like reading attempts to logically solve problems like ethics and like metaphysics and stuff. I think the first thing I really read, I think what it well in in college, I remember the first like class was Plato's Euthyphro, which is super interesting, but I think it skips over most people because it relies on being able to understand language in, like, a weird semantic context. Like, math people can get it. It was, um... I'm probably butchering this after ten years. It's Socrates arguing, and he says, like, are things good because the gods love them? Or do the gods love things because they are good? Oh, so I've actually gotten into arguments yeah. with people trying to get them to understand that those two things are not the same thing. Right. And, and this is really the... That, that. Which is the rectangle square problem. Yes. Some yeah, that's what I, I was yeah. about to say. And I I really want to know how to, to reach people yeah. when that happens. Because it, it actually is kind of painful. Because I've found my... You might have found yourself too. Unable to communicate with someone. Mm-hmm. At a at a significant and important level, where they will not, they just cannot understand you or what you're trying to say to them, mm-hmm. or sometimes they can't even understand what they're saying to you mm-hmm. because they don't see the significance right. of just a small to them. It's like, well, why does it matter? Right, and it's like, no, 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 it matters. Like, it matters a lot. It matters like putting the word "not" in a place or not putting right. the word in a place. Like, yeah, that's three letters, but that transforms everything that comes oh, I after. Think the first one. I don't know if I have a good example offhand, is like, um, it's not the case that A implies B, is I think the one that, like, is the most frustrating, because, like, if I say, um, it's not true that A implies B, so, like, if I say it's not the case that all rect- if something is a rectangle, then it's a square, it's very hard for a lot of people to get that doesn't mean all the rectangles aren't squares. Yeah. They, some of them are. Yeah, the, the, the confusion of some and all right. that happens. I think, you know, that, that very well may be something that we are um, instinctively, like, hardwired for. You'll notice, mm-hmm. like, children, they'll kind of make these errors mm-hmm. automatically, even if they're not taught. And 
uh, you know, we might assume that that you know, they're just copying their parents because their parents are doing the same yeah. thing. And it looks that way sometimes, but I've even seen well-educated, very intelligent right. parents, and they have to correct their children when they yeah. instinctively, reflexively uh, confuse some and all. Right. It, it, in fact, it very well may be that we're not very well geared right. to even th- to conceive of the idea of some. Right. Like a, a group within right. a larger a larger category. And, and I have like a weird... I don't have sort of... I've never like looked into it as a question. The, the one that stuck out to me is like, I'm not even convinced that it's unhealthy. Like the people who are very capable of abstract reasoning... Because there's traps I think they fall into, too. You, get, you can get stuck in your own head. Um, like, I know, because I guess I want to be on a list somewhere. Like, <laughs> like, the Unabomber Manifesto is lots of reasonable stuff, especially relative to reading other similar things. Like, if you hear somebody wrote a manifesto and you read it, it's usually mostly incoherent. But his is, like, a lot of fairly interesting reasoning. I've still never quite gotten how he thought bombing random people was, like, the most effective way to convince people of this. And, like, maybe if he was a bit less extreme cognitively, he would have just written books about this and had much better success. Because everyone dismisses ideas like his, like, oh, this is, like, Unabomber stuff. And it's like, Right, because people are going, you know, if I just don't listen to things from people who started blowing up random people, that's probably, on average, a good idea to just not listen to those people. Yeah, this is a lot like I had a conversation with my buddy Nathan yeah. Cumberledge about the Dark Enlightenment. And it's it's a similar thing where, like, yes, there are people who took a bunch of these ideas and did, and then decided to jump off a cliff right. and do terrible things. Like, but... They decided to jump off a cliff. I talk about this with uh, postmodern philosophy a, a lot. Mm. So, like, if you actually look at the postmodern philosophy, for instance, they're they're right right up until a certain point, mm-hmm. and then they take this weird left turn to justify. Mm-hmm. And this is where I'm going to switch. Put on my Yoon cap again, or perhaps my Jordan Peterson cap. Uh-huh. I put on a lot of caps here. <laughs> um, that they they're using legitimate reasoning to justify something that that reasoning does not justify um, in order to have a uh, rationalization for their own feelings that they are perhaps not fully um, ready to admit to themselves are their motivation. So a lot of this is like resentment. So like uh, Peterson talks about this a lot, like when you are filled with resentment, you have uh, an instinctive impulse toward revenge, like an instinct. And I I really actually, uh, if I'm convinced of one thing is that revenge is certainly something that goes right down to Mm. our biology. Like you don't have to teach someone to get that impulse to strike back or to strike out at something that that I think that's, you know, you can even see that with other animals, like that natural defensive aggression. Mm. Um, and if you've been harboring resentment for a really long time and you're an intellectual and you don't feel that you have the power to, you know, fix something or do something or don't have even perhaps the power to bring about a better world that you would like to see, um, then you become resentful. Then you go through all this reason, 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 mm-hmm. reason, reason. And then once it's it's you once you've gone so far that no, hardly anyone's going to bother checking <laughs> then you just go and do the thing that you really were motivated to do the whole time. Um, I think that's, that's often what's happening. I mean, I, I get that a lot with, uh, I don't know if you've ever read Foucault. Uh, no. I've read a bit of Foucault. He has one argument and it's like, there are in unequal power distributions in all relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he goes from there. It's like, so therefore essentially all, relationships are in some way unjust as long as they have any constraints unless everyone is perfectly equal so like mm. you know uh that would destroy just he the one i read that in was discipline and punish where essentially he makes the argument that because prisons justify their or in systems around prisons justify their own existence yeah. therefore they're evil it's like the first thing i thought was for code do you want 
prison systems that don't justify their existence, or right. they just lock people apart. Yeah, they're just running around. Hey, we should throw some people the, in the cell. The real thing he wants is actually no prisons. Yeah, it, and that goes back to Rousseau's perfect freedom of the will is stupid yeah. idea. But that, I'm getting off topic now. Yeah, um, I think one, and I think it's related to like a, a funny, I guess, structural problem with philosophy. And I mean, I don't mean like philosophy departments. I mean like the human condition is. It's way easier to tear down ideas than it is to build correct ideas. And I think there are some weird dynamics to that. Like, going clear back to Plato, there's a lot of stuff in the Republic that is correct about, like, why democracies can go bad, why dictatorships can go bad, how democracies turn into oligarchies. And you're like, this is all very interesting stuff. And then you get, like, two pages later, and his solution is like, okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to just have all the nobles... Side note, Plato completely misses, like, development mattering for, like, talent. He just assumes genetic spirit. Okay, but we're just going to have all the nobles, like, just have, like, free love polygamy so that nobody knows who's really their children. And that way, all the nobles will raise all the younger nobles to do a great job running this city. And it's like, Plato, like, how are you so confident that you have solved the problem of government? And it's like, your solution is just hoping these weird noble sex parties, like, work? Well, that would happen if you happen to be the smartest person that you interact yeah. with. You know what so I mean? Like, did you not notice that, like, your kids would still look like you, like, right? It's like the the weird detail where it's like, uh, Plato, like, I, I get your sort of theoretical theory here, but um, how many people are we talking about? Because, like, you can recognize people that are closely related to you. Yeah. And it, there, there's a lot of issues and like, what about jealousy among partners and like, right. yeah, what about if the women all want to sleep with 20% of the noblemen and the it's, other 80% are all cast to the side? It is <laughs> a funny example, just like that idea, right? And it's like a long family sort of like, I like met family member once through this like your DNA site, right? And I basically just sent them a link to my Facebook picture and I was like, hey, like just you can look at this if you want to, like. I can, like, prove I am who I say I am, given a little bit of time. And I got a message back, like, ten seconds later. I was like, oh, my God, you are, like, the clone of my uncle, or whatever. And I was like, right. So, like, Plato, did you not know that children look like their parents? Yeah, so Nietzsche would have called these uh, false idols. So uh, it derived from ideal. Because I it actually went... I, I hate this about myself, but it takes me forever to uh, recognize like etymological roots for mm -hmm. words for some reason. So like idol, ideal coming from the same word to me, like, oh, I, yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's like, it's so obvious, but then you, it's like, ah, but anyway, the idea is that an ideal is an idol and an, and an ideal isn't real. It's a representation of something that is unattainable and dead. Cause it's always made right. of stone or bronze or something. Right. And our ideas often are that. So the Taoists, because I've been reading a lot of Taoism lately, I'm excited to get back into Confucianism mm -hmm. because my martial arts training, the culture is entirely Confucian, I realize now, because the Taoists <laughs> like to poke at the Confucians yeah. for being too uptight. Um, but um, one of the things I realized is like, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm borrowing a lot here. So yeah. I, I haven't read through Aquinas, but I've heard it reported that his definition for God is like, that is, which is. Okay. And I really like using that definition for things. So like I, I, I'm not religious, so I don't really think in terms of God. But like, if there is that is, which is like that's like assuming there's an objective reality transcendent to our perception of it. Like there is something there mm -hmm. here. It's not just us projecting onto nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our idol, our false idols, our our false idols, our ideals are the projections. They are the things mm -hmm. that aren't. Because they are not that is which is. They are mm -hmm. that which isn't. And so, uh, and I like to connect that back. This is getting very Peterson-esque here, uh, throwing a lot of names around. Sorry, it's a bad habit. But um, I think about the story of Cain and Abel. And actually, this is inverted because it's from reading The Antichrist by Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. Abel is the ideal, and he dies. And all the humans afterwards are children of Cain. Mm -hmm. 
And it kind of suggests that like you actually can't be the ideal. You'll get killed. Mm-hmm. And that you are necessarily the inheritor of uh let's say the the person who doesn't live up to the ideal. And I think that there's something really useful in that to because it recognizes that like when we sit there and theorize and think like, okay, well this should make this should right. should I'm moving air quotes here make sense that immediately to remember um that we are human and that this projection, this idea is never a reality. It's always the shadow on the wall of the cave. And that this is, I think where Plato was wrong. Like you, when you go out and look at the world, mm-hmm. sure. Relative to you, those people are seeing shadows, but mm-hmm. you're not seeing the atoms that make up mm-hmm. the, the universe. You're not seeing the electrons of the world. You're not seeing the subatomic particles. You're not seeing other you know things that are spec right. even just beyond our spectrum of color that we can see right the mistake is thinking you hit you hit the end you now see everything it's like right. no, no 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 you don't and that's very difficult not to become do you ever way. see because it's like to me the most weird example of this have you ever seen the the idea not like in a conspiracy way but the the observation that the earth does not go in an oval shape um, so this would be like this is not like a flat Earth thing. So it's it's just it's a non oval. So thing. so what it is is like you know we we live on the Earth. Presumably everybody listening lives on Earth, and like from our physical perspective, we're on an unmoving thing that the sun goes over, and then at some point you learn enough astronomy, physics, whatever you want to call it, that we understand that it makes much more sense to think of the universe as the sun is this giant thing that we are orbiting and we're spinning. And, you know, you you learn this sort of idea, the other planets are doing the same thing, the moon's orbiting us like how we orbit the sun. And it's not that that's false, it's not that... But it's kind of interesting because if you zoom out far enough, the sun is orbiting the Milky Way, or is part of the sort of shell of the Milky Way. So, like, if you were sufficiently above, which is a weird word in this context, the Milky Way galaxy, then it looks like the sun is doing a big semicircular movement. And if you look at the Earth from that perspective, it's not going in a circle. It's going in a circle relative to where the sun is. So you can picture, like, if you have... It's the good in it. It's like... You have a thing spinning on the end of another thing spinning. Well, the moon's not going in a circle because we're going around the sun and the moon is spinning around yeah. us. It's sort of like you, you took a pen and you started whirling it and then you whirled it in a circle. You get this kind of like yeah. It's not a. It's not really a circle, is it? It's like this. Yeah. Uh, what would you? I don't know what you'd call that. Uh, it looks like one of those bungee things you put on your keys so you could have it on your wrist. You know, <laughs> talking about, but that's kind of what it would. Yeah. Except you would have those. Inside of those, inside of those. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Cause one of the weird... And I'm not a physics person. I'm not able to do any of the technical. Is like One of the weird things that happened through the development of science was like... Realizing certain questions don't make sense metaphysically. It would have like... Is something moving is not really a workable question if I understand my relativity correctly. Like, if we just say, is the sun in motion? It's like, well, we have to figure out what counts as not moving. And there's all these weird... Yeah, and that like... immediately causes problems. I have this with energy. Like, we can obviously measure energy. Mm-hmm. But if you actually sit down, even with, like, an engineer or a physicist, because I've done this, mm-hmm. and you try and get them to explain what energy is... Yeah. We don't actually know. We just see its effects. Yeah. Like, there's... What's my favorite... And I've ironically had to never learn how radio works because of this idea. Is I, I've joked before that I have no idea how radios work. Because like like a telegram, I understand you're sending a signal through a wire. I don't really know how that works either, but I get it. And a computer is just a massively more scaled up version of that. I don't know how you're beaming a signal off of the air. Like it just and what's funny is the number of times I've said this. And somebody not thinking through like what I'm saying goes, oh no, it just works like Wi-Fi. And <laughs> well, then you have to beg the question. Like, and it's well, like, well, 
Well, no, because most Wi-Fi is close enough that it's not as weird. Because if I say, how are we talking across this table? It's like, well, I guess sound moves through the air. Well, the air is being, we're vibrating yeah. air, right? And I would think with radio, it's radio waves. It's a form of radiation. Yeah. So what we're, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but if I know my subatomic particles right, yeah. they, you're, you are, let's say, inputting energy as to put a, a charge a, across. Well, that would be like, Probably not that, because I think it's like gamma radiation. Yeah. I think at least one destroyed. person thought I was like questioning whether radio was real when I like. Well, no, my point is not that I'm like I'm not going anywhere with this. Like the government's been lying to you. There is no radio or whatever. Well, that's a you know that's our all in some problem. Yeah. You know, because and, and the reason why I kind of toned back when I say that is because um, it actually it's something painful for me to remember because what that means is that. When the person asks you that, mm. you've hit a limit and they've, at least in that moment, hopefully just for that moment, but usually it's not, mm -hmm. right? Usually it's like it, it's in many parts of the conversation for the whole conversation. Maybe for the whole time you know that person your whole life. Mm -hmm. That person cannot distinguish between you just accepting wholesale without any uh, explanation how radio works. I'm not saying you're saying it doesn't work, but like you, you want to know right. the parts in, in there. Like they can't differentiate you just accepting it wholesale with rejecting it wholesale. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, uh, like for, for instance, I encountered this with, um, with politics. Cause I'm one of those like kooky, like and caps, even though I don't think that'll ever happen, but that would, that anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I really don't like the idea of uh, state funded ed education. And I even try to say state funded there to like qualify, mm -hmm. like, Yes, I actually do think people should be educated. Mm -hmm. I just think the state does a bad job. And, it, and if it starts out doing a good job, it ends up doing a bad job pretty fast. Um, whether that's true or not, the response almost always is that I don't desire for children to be educated. Right. And it's like, and, and there's no parsing the, the difference right. there with people. Um, and that's kind of sad because it's, there's a whole, let's say uh population i guess you could say or uh, of people who at least i know i run into on a daily basis where i hit that wall mm -hmm. and i hit it and then i suddenly get dropped into like the realm of loneliness where it's like oh, yeah wow. I, I i guess what's weird is like i'm pretty like the unabomber thing <laughs> you're going to this problem that like sense why you look back um, where where I'm sympathetic is like there's a really basic problem that we all hit, which is there's too much stuff to think about all of it. So like your brain does all sorts of pruning type stuff to not waste too much energy. And like one part of that is like if you're just talking to somebody, you're trying to figure out how worthwhile the conversation is and you're trying to figure out if you should quickly move away from talking about like politics or religion or whatever for various reasons <laughs> like not wanting to get in a fist fight in a mcdonald's <laughs> right so like th there is an extent to which i i would sort of bet that it's healthy that people won't entertain things too far away from their current point not because, like, that always works really well, but just because, like, um, or as as by contrast, this happened a bunch with COVID. Like, what I said a million times was, like, it's okay to have reasonable skepticism of medical experts, but you should be much more skeptical of people who aren't medical experts claiming they know more than the medical experts. Yeah, that that yeah. doesn't mean the medical experts are right about everything. It's like if if you're only going to think about this for 20 minutes a day, the gamble on trusting your doctor is a lot safer than the gamble on not trusting your doctor. Yeah, I I say I get in the the problem. Yeah. Where I tell people not to gamble. I'm like, like learn basic scientific literacy so that right. when you listen to someone, you at least know when they are lying to you. Right. Because that, like, I, I tried to even teach that to college students. Um, that didn't work. 
by the mm. way, trying to teach scientific literacy. To, this is something spooky. So you have a group of a uh, group of adults, mm-hmm. right? Um, and they could be, you know, 18, 19, 20. And there are some who will either have already or very quickly understand, mm-hmm. um, let's say, the type of uh, errors that they they need to not make. Because fundamentally, if you're doing philosophy, most of it's just not making those two errors. Right. Right. Like that's if you can do not make those two errors, you're basically set. You can then you can just, you know, you're in the playground right. and start exploring. Um there are perhaps maybe at most a quarter of a class mm. at most. And that's, that's being generous. And the rest, you know, I, part of me desires to be able to impart at least that ability so that they are not, um, I don't want to call them lemmings because right? that's insulting. And, I, I keep hearkening, not hearkening. I keep thinking back to when I was reading um, "Human All Too Human," mm-hmm. and the reason the book's titled that way, which uh, I didn't figure this out by the way, Nietzsche says in "Echo Homo," his like mini autobiography, mm-hmm. talks about what he was doing with all his books. Mm-hmm. And with "Human All Too Human," he wanted us to realize that the things that we get frustrated with mm-hmm. and we are disappointed with or hate about people that we often as- ascribe as inhuman mm-hmm. are actually the most human things mm-hmm. like those things are intrinsic to human being and so you're wrong for wanting them to be different that's kind of his mm-hmm. argument like you, you in reality the reality is they are that way these are human beings yeah. so your ideal is as bullshit basically is what he was yeah, see like my my hot take on the, like a couple things like this some podcasts is like i think There's a lot of funny biases that are smart people talking to other smart people biases. So, for instance, what I've seen recently is I keep seeing pop up the, like, intelligence doesn't matter that much for, like, success in the context of, like, people who have a master's degree in, like, engineering or something. It's like, do you not think you're in the top 10-ish percent of, like, intelligence which is obviously a little bit nebulous but but a lot of people who like i immediately can tell they're fairly close to the top but they're trying very hard to pose it as being hard work because that's more virtuous if you earned it by doing the work more than or as i joke like you know i could practice twice as hard as kobe did and he would be 10 times better at basketball than me yeah because clearly the physiology was better. Clearly the mentality was way better at competing. You know. Yeah. Have you ever heard the bell curve? No. I've, I've heard little bits of it. It's, yeah. I, I like the bell curve a lot, actually. It gets a bad rap, but the, I mean, it's very obvious that yeah. uh, both writers, uh, Murray, I, can't, I can never remember the second yeah. guy because he never gets named. But yeah. um, they really have the best intentions at heart. And they actually make this argument yeah. like, look, if you're reading this book, you are in like the top. I don't know, X percentile. I can't remember. They basically say you're probably right. more than, uh, you're definitely more than one standard deviation mm-hmm. above the mean. If you're bothering to read the book and you got this far into the book. Right. So this will seem wrong to you and impossible. Right. But what we're saying is this is the reality that there is this distribution and we see these outcomes across the distribution. And rather than just lie to ourselves and say that people aren't, differently able in various ways we mm. should accept that that's the case and like make sure that people have a place in the world and like they aren't yeah screwed because like you said if you just want to put it all down to hard work and actually it's not that but then you yeah. let's say oh let me try and social engineer society and if ever, if we just give everyone education they'll all be coders right. it's like well what if a bunch of them won't be coders right. no matter what yeah. What do you do then with the winter social engineering plan yeah. falls apart, right? Um, but yeah, I like the and, and the IQ thing, like I was saying, I when all the IQ stuff comes up and all the race IQ stuff comes up, I well, we didn't have to bring race into I know. I'm obviously avoiding that. I know. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going any deeper. I I'm very sort of sympathetic to the idea that like a lot of people treat it like a tripwire because they know there are a lot of people who want 
very bad things to be true for bad reasons. Like, there's a lot of people who would love the result of there being racial IQ differences because it would let them justify very bad things they already believe. Mm -hmm. Right? Because, like, what I would want is for a study to pop out and go, yeah, there's no ethnicity IQ correlation. Like, we spent a bajillion dollars looking for one, and there isn't. That'd be like, oh, good. Yeah, this thing you'd put it to rest, right? Yeah, I don't have to listen to this anymore. Anytime these people pop up and go, okay, they're racist, we spent a bajillion dollars, and we made sure they were wrong. So it's like, this is that same thing. It's like, abstractly, I know why a legitimate scientist might want to look into genetic intelligence stuff. But I also see why lots of reasonable people are holistically looking at that and going, you know, nothing good is coming out of that hole. I actually disagree. I think the problem is, because I, I often say you need to look into the abyss. Like, yeah. Because as painful as it is, it's also where, you know, it's a, uh, Jordan Peterson again, right? The dragon, like you got to go into the dragon's den to get the treasure or the virgin or yeah. whatever. Like the things that you want are in the dangerous place where it's uncomfortable. And, yeah. um, like, let's, uh, I, I will wade a little bit into this. Um, hopefully, YouTube doesn't kill us. It probably won't notice we exist, to be honest. But, well, like, right for the first five minutes where you can't say fuck. Yeah. I think that's a real thing. <laughs> I have no idea. I've seen channels say, like, don't swear in the first minute. That might be true because the bots can't. Yeah. yeah I mean, they could view everything but um like i uh even like with the bell curve looked at the um, distribution of, like race and iq and a lot of it actually seems to be um the result of um what they described as uh dysgenic mate selection that could be got rid of really fast because if you look at iq distributions over time mm. and this is going to be controversial itself but yeah like IQ is largely heritable genetically. Now, obviously, there's a bunch of ways you can be damaged, basically, yeah. as a child, where you'll right. never reach whatever potential you might have had. Right. It's very easy to do. Again, very hard to build, very yeah. easy to destroy. Um, but what they found was, essentially, amongst all groups, like IQ measures across time, like they went up, 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 up really fast. Yeah. And what it seems to me is that if you don't have let's say social factors preventing uh what i think evolution would naturally push for which is an increase in iq selection because if iq allows you to survive and reproduce better which right. it very well seems well we're running to a problem actually where it seems like there's it a does right up until you find warhammer lore super interesting yeah well there is well there is a point where at a certain point people stop reproducing as much yeah and maybe that's like the evolutionary threshold where the best IQ hits a point and then it, yeah. you don't want to actually breed past that because it won't. As a tangent related to this, right, with with all the extraterrestrial life speculation, yeah. there's always these like, well, where are all the aliens? Because there's, you know, billions and billions of stars, etc. And like, it occurred to me a couple years ago that like, the most bizarrely cynical explanation is just the super boring one that like, all the aliens hit a point where they're like, yeah, let's just like, not they just sort of, like, they get to some planetary or solar system level of stability, and they just sort of stop. Well, then there's there's actually, um, to get archetypal again, there is a um, kind of this weird anti-natalism will to death. So if you study Buddhism, um, that, oh, I should, I should take, a, take a step back. So life comes with it like effort and suffering and bitterness mm -hmm. and pain and negative things. And you actually have to expend energy and um, kind of willpower just to sustain life, mm -hmm. like to live, to be in the world. Right. And so there is that question, like, is this worthwhile? Like, yeah. or, you know, uh, Mephistopheles and Faust uh, supposes that it, you know, the universe is so constructed that it, is justified that it be destroyed. Everything that comes to be deserves to perish wretchedly. And so I think that is a natural inclination. I think we see that with, uh, to be frank, I think we see that with a lot of social engineering programs is this deep unconscious will uh, to lie down in the snow, like the Russian soldiers. It's like, uh, when yeah. you're, you know, you're in this bitter cold, just die, lay down yeah. and die um, because the pain is too great. 
Um, and I think all, that's one answer to the, uh, let's say, resentment about the world or despair about the world not being as we might want it to be. Yeah. Um, and so for like the idea of alien life. Like, and it sort of pops up in weird spots, which not stuff we can get into, but like, it pops up. So it's like any sort of political discourse, especially now that we have social media, there's there's always the next person with the slightly crazier view. Like wherever, whichever group you're in, there's always the next person. So like if you look at like any abortion debate or any euthanasia debate or like the antinatalism, like the actual people talking about not having kids, like there's always people at the edge who are like saying stuff that I find genuinely very disturbing. Cause there's, there's always the euthanasia person who's like, yeah, if I was 50 and like I had a bad hip, I might just end it. Like, like that's not the mainstream person, but it's always like, yeah, you always have the, uh, the fringes. There. Yeah. You have the, like, you have the, like celebrate abortion people. And I'm like, this is not healthy. Yeah, like that, that is... fundamentally cannot be coming from a healthy place. No, uh, there, uh, that one's we don't have to get into it, right? Uh, specifically, but like the abortion debate is always frustrating me to me because no one actually has the conversation about what the issue is. It's yeah. always yeah, it it, it it's a, it's it's just annoying. It's just yeah. dishonesty. Um, I discovered a weird one if we have time for a funny story sure, related so. to this. It's yeah. not bad. It was like, I I sort of run as a joke that like my goal in life is to have a statue that says Joshua Phillips, he was an idiot that solved problems. <laughs> like I love my dumb ideas that are good ideas because they're dumb. And one is I've said for years, like just distribute condoms by paying unemployed people. I mean, employ them to drive old ice cream vans around throwing condoms at teenagers. And, like, what's interesting is, maybe that's a bad idea. I'm very open to the possibility that, like, wouldn't be a good idea. But what's interesting is I've had multiple people get upset with that idea, and they go, no, what we should do is castrate all the drug users. And I'm like, do you not see how much, it's like, <laughs> My idea is clearly, like, safer. It doesn't have any sort of, like, immense moral hazard where, like, I'm not going to wake up in five years and go, oh, God, I'm Hitler if we do this. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you can only go so wrong in the short term. And that I find it, I've had people oppose doing that because they want to do something that's sort of transparently a much more, you know, morally fraught in my opinion horrifying of course it's like they hate the idea of like a functional solution to the problem because I, I think there's people where if you said like hey I could drop abortions by 50% they'd be like that's not acceptable it's like well do you want there to be less or not <laughs> yeah yeah I get uh, that's because that you could use the uh to flip it, like the the feminist side, where it's like I could drop, you know, women being assaulted by fifty percent, they're right. going to be upset about it because it's like, yeah. it's not, you know, making it zero. It's like, look, right, you you can't make it zero, okay? Like we're not we're not doing that. Right. And if you could, the solution is probably worse yeah. than the problem. So like the yeah, it, it is frustrating. It's been the pattern where like, and again, I'm not saying my ideas are always like good ideas, but we're like people it's like an element of sort of moral crusading where it's like a frustration at a pragmatic approach to a problem that isn't even in contradiction with their in principle moral ideas they're supporting because if i said like hey i found a version of alcohol that's less addictive there'd probably be people within a day who'd be like mad i'm not a prohibitionist yeah, they, they, uh, yeah. So, what is that then? Because what that is, is there's a need to oppose. There's a need to take a stance of moral superiority, right? right? Um, there's an opposition to actually solving the problem. It reminds me right. of a bureaucracy. It makes them less right, too, doesn't it? Like, 
Like, they no longer get to be correct against society. Because now I'm the annoying guy who's like, hey, we could make the problem partially go away. Yeah, oh, that reminds me of, uh, I keep bringing people up, but um, what's his name? Jordan Peterson brings up uh, Lomberg, Bright, or is it Bryce Long? No, Bjorn, know, Bjorn Lomberg. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and where essentially it's like, oh, well, hey, guys, actually, if we develop the third world economically first, right. then we'll be able to tackle like a bunch of these environmental issues right. way better. Yeah. And if we don't do this first, it's going to basically just right. not, we're not going to be able to do it because, you yeah. know, China's producing most of the freaking. Well, it's like, you know, what would happen? It's like, what would happen if we stopped using fossil fuels? And the answer is like hundreds of millions of people in Asia would starve to death. Yeah. And a massive force would be cut right. down because we need to start using what we'd have to right. use. Right. Uh, and I had this argument before with a, it's a Californian, I'll, I'll call him. Where I was trying to explain, like, look, every solution that we've had to, like, our energy problems, like, our benefit, it bring, brought new problems that were less bad than the mm -hmm. problems we had before. So when we switch to fossil fuels, as dirty as fossil fuels might be, that's way less dirty than the thing that came before that, which wood. is, yeah, like, yeah. burning wood and coal uh, and uh, coke or whatever, like, you know. Yeah. So, like... The, because it's and same with nuclear power like i think nuclear power probably has its problems but you know maybe that will need to be yeah. so that we can produce enough power so that maybe we can get right. like the third world up and running and then some other genius will come out and like figure out a better right. better way or like it's but the idea that it doesn't you know yeah that, i think that's what it is there's an ideal in the in their heads right and they feel like be, if they have the solution, I think that makes them feel competent. It makes them feel smart, like yeah. they're important. Right. And because they they're really not, and they really haven't thought it through, any pragmatism pokes a hole in their uh, their persona, the mask that they put yeah. on to protect themselves from who they really are. It's just like a normal person. Yeah. It's probably not going to make a significant difference outside of your direct immediate. Place. I always called it um. I always joke about, like, people thinking they're clever. It's, like, a lot of it, where it's, like... And, I mean, I do it, too. I think it's, like, a normal ego thing. But where, like, you can get very obsessed with, like, having cognitively got one over on people. Like, I think a lot of conspiracy theory stuff ends up being people who want to be right. And they want most people to be on the other side of them. Like, they actually wouldn't be happy being in agreement with the majority. And I'm sure I fall into that, because, like, um, I, I always joke that, like, if I start noticing people agreeing with me too much, I start checking. Like, maybe. I think, because when I think of conspiracy-minded people, I think that they are, let's say, um open in a way that allows and i mean that you're familiar with the big five personality model yeah a little you know, bit a, a little bit so yeah. openness is one of them i think they're open enough that they see associations right and um it's very easy to see if you look slowly let's take the most controversial figure alex jones yeah like you actually look at the things he's looking at right it's not super unreasonable that if your whole job is just to keep looking through this stuff right and then like Let's say half to three quarters of it is true. Yeah. What happens to your mind? Because, like, it becomes so difficult. It's going to become difficult to not believe the conclusion when, like, everything you think shouldn't really be is. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think, yeah. uh, you know, you can get into the that. And I think us, we as animals, are built to perceive agents. Mm -hmm. Like, like, think of all mythologies. Uh, or like animism mm -hmm. it's imposing um a will and spirit into mm -hmm. the world um and like all the different gods are those different wills that are kind of pushing everything mm -hmm. around so i think that's actually our natural inclination even is to see those wills and so the idea that like i can think something is a conspiracy it's mm -hmm. kind of a it's a weird miracle at all actually that we're not all conspiracy it's, theories. And I mean, I guess to some extent it's like a sensibility problem because like if you ask as a random example like why did the Roman Empire collapse? Well, my guess knowing almost nothing of history is that that question is a bad question because there was probably a lot of stuff going on 
and to my knowledge, there's no one single thing that's like sufficiently. It's not like a meteor hit and destroyed Italy. Yeah, because obviously, in principle, something could have happened that literally like disintegrated the prospect of the Roman Empire existing. But like, I think this is related, like the the lying with statistics kind of thing, where people talk about a lot, like how you can lie with statistics. I always point out there's a certain political slant, but like I end up watching a bunch of Fox News at work. <laughs> it's on the television. Because it's on all the televisions because a lot of people really want to watch it at high volume all day. And a, a weird disagreement I've had with a lot of people who I agree with on a lot of things is that they'll say all Fox does is lie all day. And I'm like, no, like, take, like, whatever you consider their worst show and watch it for an hour and pay attention to how many things they say that are lies in the clearest of senses. Because, of course, that's not how you do propaganda. No. You don't just make things up. What you do is, like, you point out, in this example, right, you point out that Hillary Clinton got a donation from this foundation, and she spoke at one of their events, and they got a contract, and here's a pedophile who worked there, and it... Yeah, so there's a combination of and, poisoning the well with right. um, fr a negative framing effect. Right. Yeah, yeah. Because so, like, it's... It and that's very hard, because if you want to, like, debunk that, well, like, there's not necessary. There's a lot of assumptions in there. And there's a lot of there, there's a lot of steps where lots of different things could be true, but they are rapidly pruning off all except the most convenient to them. Yeah. Like a murder TV show, right? You'll notice that like all the murder TV shows have to be narratively interesting. So like it can't be, yep, it was a gang shooting. Oh, what happened? Well, these two guys were both drug dealers, and they'd been sort of, like, near the same area, and I guess they decided it was time to, like, they just shot the guy. Like, that's not compelling. Yeah. Like, you're not... So it's got to be, like, dramatic. And what that means is, and this makes sense probabilistically, or to reframe it, like, you'll have a murder case. Like, it's national attention. And this is probably, like, the square rectangle thing we were talking about earlier. So there'll be a case where, like, woman goes missing. Usually attractive woman goes missing. That's a whole psych thing to think about. And, like, was on vacation with her husband. Now, obviously, the single most likely explanation is that her husband murdered her. That is, if we had to guess... And you're just using pure statistics. Right. If we had to guess what happened... And we get a million dollars if our guess is correct and God is officiating or whatever. We're clearly betting on the husband. It'd be really weird to not, in a sense. But yeah. what people will say is, they will say, it must have been him. Which is also wrong, right? Right. Yeah, Because it, it could not have. Like, there's... Like, maybe it's, like, 60% chance or 55% chance that it was the husband, which is right. why you put the bet there, because numbers yeah. right because it's very hard to distinguish like i think i called it surprising this at one point where it's like you know so you have this murder case if i found out the husband murdered the wife in the story would i be surprised at all well no because it was the most likely single thing i don't know the numbers offhand but it's it highly dominates everything else put together, I'm pretty yeah, sure. It's like sexual assault. It's the same thing. It's right. someone you know who's close to you. Right. Um, it's like, would I be surprised? Well, no. That doesn't mean I'm that confident. And you also wouldn't be surprised if it was, I don't know. It would be very easy to change our minds if it's like, oh, we found this video of like... Or telling the husband went to a bar, and then here's video of the wife leaving the the, the like hotel, and she like goes around a corner. We can't find any other foot. It's like, well, I'm I'm very easily able to update me. Like, oh, now it's distinctly less likely it was him. Yeah, uh, 
and it's it's no less surprising at the same time because you acknowledge it could be right. this and if i had to bet it's going to be this but if you get this other detail yeah. okay well this seems to suggest that it wasn't it, and there are these other actors right. and with this piece of evidence right. it means that this might not fall into one of these you know yeah. large statistics you ever like paid attention to election forecasting um like at all i don't mean i i, I don't really yeah. probably not not really so like a, a super interesting observation about election forecasting is forecasting an election is super thankless because a very basic problem which is let's say you and i are running for office and the polls have you up 20 points and the poll or so the pollsters are like right marquis going to win 90% chance and you win by 15 points, they were projecting 20, you win by 15. Nobody goes, hey, the pollsters called that blowout pretty well. Because everyone knew that you were favored in that race. But if the pollsters go, ooh, Josh is leading by like a point or two, so it's pretty much a coin flip. Well, if I lose, they get so much flack. Even if they're only off by two points. So like... They have this problem that we really care about one point on that spectrum, because who wins obviously matters. So, like, it's a similar thing where it's like, well, if a race is roughly 50-50, neither outcome should make me shocked at the outcome in the morning. Yeah. But we're very bad at understanding that, like, that's kind of a limit on our sort of day-to-day -day reasoning ability is... Saying, you know, this race is 50-50 and the results come back 52-48. That's a better polling prediction than saying it's going to be 60-40 and it comes back 53-47. Even though the second one actually feels like they predicted it better. Yeah, it's playing on, uh, or rather our heuristics are playing with the actual results. Yeah, uh, instinctive it's... pattern seeking, which... It makes sense because we didn't evolve to be in society doing math. We evolved to be throwing right. like spears at large right. mammals. So there's a lot of things that are because we're not local. Like we live in communities with big connections, and there's a lot of weird things that pop up. Um, I remember, I think I'd heard it before, but it came back to me. It was like you'll hear people say a lot, like we didn't wear bike helmets when we were kids, and we're fine now. Like the older generation, yeah. and it's like literally survivorship bias yeah yeah, yeah. only the people who weren't wounded are going to say that the, the problem is when you say that a skeleton doesn't pop out of the ground and go no -uh, i died yeah yeah that there I, I hear a lot of that at work a lot of the retired yeah you know, um specifically this is a little frustration of mine because you can't see it like yeah. like your brain like, if I said, you know, which city are you more likely to get murdered living in? And I just list two cities. Like, you can look at the murder rate, but, like, you don't know how concentrated... It's like, it's, it would be hard to actually decide where it's safer to live if they're similar enough. Yeah. Uh, man. Yeah. But I, I get this frustration um, where I'll get someone who comes in, and they they have a valid point to some degree. So it'll be some grumpy old man, and he's really irritated about, like the younger generation is a stereotype yeah. right and to some extent i think okay but then i also think you raised your kids who right. raised the kids right so what is it that you did or failed to do right that's that set this on this trajectory and i've actually yeah. asked them before and are pointed out they, they usually don't respond right. because they it it does that short circuit where it yeah. puts them in an uncomfortable position where it's like and actually now I've heard um, Dennis Prager's argument, and I actually agree with Dennis Prager's argument, is that we had a couple of generations back, people who were uh, essentially poor, relatively, mm, right. and they worked really hard and they were fixated on uh, material wealth and they mm -hmm. forgot all of the non-material mm -hmm. things that their parents had perhaps at least if not handed down to them directly was present in their home mm -hmm. and in their families and communities or whatever. And so what they did is impart pure materialism into their children right. who then now do not have the same, let's say they let's say they gave their children what they didn't have, but didn't give them what they did. I think that's the Dennis Craig, yeah. Craiger quote. And um, yeah, you do see that where if you're, you're only looking at, let's say 
what was important to you. And then it eliminates the fact that there are other variables at play yeah. at all. I, I think the frustration, because I can kind of picture it. I think I was like thinking through it, like after my dad died, COVID related. Like, I, I think a lot of that as people get older is like, they find out that they weren't building the future they thought they were participating in. So like, because like you make a lot of, especially if people have kids, make a lot of decisions with a lot of implicit long term what they want to happen. And a lot of that doesn't come true in the way they were thinking it would come true, or it doesn't come true at all. Like, because, I mean, in, in this case, first, like, just the rate of technological change and everything especially recently like if you lived in the 1400s and it's like it's entirely plausible that like if you lived in like the middle ages which i know is a misnomer and yeah i'm not making a historical argument per se you know you could have been born grown up and like your plan was don't do any criminal stuff try to get slightly better at farming than your dad was don't get killed by the nobleman and like hopefully you're leaving your kid a slightly bigger farm because, like, maybe somebody will die and you'll buy half of their farm. Like, and again, historians, this is not historical. Yeah. Right? But nowadays, like, if you... Like, if you had kids that were born... I was born in 91, so, like, the world in 91 compared to that. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's Cell phones didn't exist in a meaningful, widespread way. Yeah, I was born in 92, so I kind of, uh, yeah, I was still a kid, but I remember the world before. Yeah. Right. And it was very different. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's what you're saying reminded me of, uh, you played Half Life, I'm sure. No. No. Weird. Okay. Well, the G Man, the government man, yeah. he, uh, I can't remember the exact line, but he mentions unforeseen consequences. Right. And like, it's funny that there's so much profundity in something like Half Life. Yeah. But that's actually true that, you know, life, has these consequences that you really cannot predict. There's just, mm. you don't have, there's no way to calculate right. the difference. I get frustrated when people want to play God or want to play social engineer. They put forward these big ideas, yeah. right? And it's like, look, you pull the one thread yeah. and then the rest of the web is going to shake. And probably what will happen is the spider wakes up and comes and fucking yeah. kills you because like, it's so, again, so easy to destroy everything, right. right? It's really easy to wake up the spider by accident. And you're, you know. Did I ever tell you, I think I called it like the chaos theory objection to utilitarianism. You think you mentioned that to so, me before. And I, I think the calculation problem, in I don't think I've like innovated the whole idea. But I made the sort of weird point about a lot of consequentialist ethics that... The problem isn't just that you can't perfectly calculate the consequences of your actions. The problem that's kind of weird is like there's a there's a bunch of unknown unknowns to quote a random speech by a defense secretary that everyone hated. Um I always liked that speech and like people thought it meant I loved him. Like, no, I just thought the speech was good. But uh so like and here's my historical example. If you lived in, like, 1850, like you're in like a young adult in 1850, you'd be basically convinced that pouring money into scientific research is, like, the best idea ever. And there would be nothing to really point against that. 1850, right? There's nothing, like, that's gone wrong catastrophically due to science research. Um, right. Native Americans dying off, not a science research problem. Except yeah. for Columbus. Like, it's it's not... So, like, imagine, you know, you get you got time-traveled or whatever, and you, like, fund research a little better in 1850 somehow. Well, the weird thing is not just that you don't know what'll happen. The weird thing is, like, if you fund science research a little better, but, oh, you're living in Germany. A hundred years later, you know, Nazi Germany gets the nuclear weapons first. Like... And the point is, nobody in 1850 
could have reasonably inferred that a genocidal nuclear war was a logical consequence of what they were. Yeah. They were just hoping for slightly more cures for STDs. Yeah, and I, I think you work that backward with like something like slavery, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, back in the day, you still listen to a lot of Stefan Molyneux, and he's where I heard this argument. Uh, and it was like, look, you can't go back in time and say, listen, in the future, you're not going to, like, slavery, you don't right. need it. You're going to have gigantic, like, metal horses that run on dinosaur <laughs> juice, and they're going to do 10 times or 100 times the labor in half the time. Right. Like, you can't convince people. Right. And it's like, and you could, like, you, you know, the idea that, like, most of the world, or at least most of what they would consider, like, the world, no slavery and every and things are working out much better. Like, trust yeah. me, it's going to work. They, like, you're not going to be able to convince people who have no, not only no frame of reference, but no way to have a frame of reference right. and um, no reason to even imagine such, mm -hmm. right? They're just limited. Again, we come back to the fact that we're monkeys. We're limited. Like, yeah. we're, we're not, you know, disembodied wills yeah. floating in the ether. Um, with that, we've been going for a while. Yeah. Um, to, to wrap this up, I guess I, because I, I really, we, we went far in a field. It was very fun. It was a fun conversation. Um, but is there, is there anything, let's say, any word of advice you might give or, or a tactic that you've used that might work when you're running into these problems? We talked a lot about errors, like heuristic errors people mm -hmm. make or their, um, you know, inability to distinguish between, uh, let's say, categories of things or right. making false promises. Like when, when you want to, when you want to be able to express yourself genuinely and authentically with someone, you don't want to just, and it's sometimes obviously you just have to hold your tongue. Like there's mm -hmm. some people you don't have a close relationship with. Right. But if there's someone that you do, like one of your friends, your family mm -hmm. member or something like that, and you get into this issue mm -hmm. and you have to, you have to tell somebody because I know there's right. someone, or maybe hopefully one day there's someone who's going to listen to this and get this far to the end of the podcast. And they're going to know, Josh, what do yeah. you do when that happens? I, what do you do? I mean, I think to some extent what I attempt to do with who knows what level of success in life is like people that are reachable are reachable by like, softly questioning the premises without pushing it too hard. So, like, because um, I use the example, like, the exercise physiology stuff, don't try to teach someone a complete theory of whatever's going on. Just point out that, like, here's, like, an assumption that kind of crept in, and it's probably half true. That's probably how it crept in, is that it's just very often the case that, like, you learn something by realizing you were making a weird assumption, and that that assumption was just implicit. Um, I think check your premises is the old Rand quote, which I <laughs> did a ton of reading of back in the day. Um, had multiple weird arguments with people that thought they were Rand experts, and they knew less than me. <laughs> you probably know more than me. I have... Right, as much money as I could. Yeah. But, but that, that's what pops it. up is like checking the assumptions you're making about like when there's a big idea checking if the idea is true without being like pedantic about it which is very hard to draw the distinction because it's like saying you know the trick to being a good boxer is to be good at boxing. It's like jab as much as you should jab and dodge as far as you ought to dodge. It's like you should always be checking and looking for possible objections to your ideas without just trying to find some bizarre objection. So it's almost like it's an art form more than it is a science because of the individual nature of things. It's like just hard because it's not... It's hard because it's hard, which is going to be my quote I'm stuck with for the rest of my life now, I think. Like, as like a very weird example, to be very short, a whole lot of political philosophy doesn't work with conjoined twins. So if you're stating something about politics, you should just be like, look, there's a very small number of people 
that my theory of how to organize the court system just will not work for. Like, that's not an objection we need to spend every day worrying about because it's not going to happen a bunch. But but that's what's hard is like, what's a sufficiently unimportant objection to an idea? Yeah. What's like, significant, what's really significant, what's really relevant? And that's right. probably going to be, it's probably not going to be the yeah. same from person to person, even right. if you're dealing with the same issue. I will never have a Euthyphro level book that is profound enough to solve the like, how to not make conceptual errors problem. Because I'm sure I make them every day. Like, yeah. Um, I got caught so many times lifting stuff where it's like, there's so many ideas that people say. And you often don't realize you agreed with the whole idea, even though only, only the first part was like justified. Yeah. So they, they it, yeah, that's, um, I, I don't I'm not going to open up a whole can of worms, right. but you see this a lot with, um, I'll be very specific, like third and fourth wave uh, feminism. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like you believe that like men and women should be treated equally under the law. Yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Wasn't well, your feminist. And then there's like a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah, tacked on there that right. You haven't really like most people they won't think about it. Well, it's a classic Mott and Bailey yeah. sort of thing, right? It's like should because because what problem is with yeah without getting too deep, but it's like the problem is there's two different things there. One is like should the law not be doing bad sexist stuff, and I I think we've gotten to the point where that's a very high majority position. Like, if there was a law that says women can't drive without a man in the car, we would all say that's bad. Yeah. But, like, figuring out what constitutes the law being fair is quite a mess, especially when you're talking about that kind of a distinction. Like, if you said, should the law treat tall people differently? It's like, well, there's not really any... There's not a lot of circumstances where we could picture it being unclear what it would look like to treat tall and short people similarly enough. Like, the height of doors at public buildings, like, like, there's... Yeah. There's no awkward problem there, where it's like, what is treating men and women equal? Does it mean everyone gets drafted? How do you handle paternity rights? Because being a parent is not physiologically equal. Yeah, they're, like... like Trying to make a an ideal idyllic right. system fit a non ideal right. reality, and like to this, I think I mentioned like the eighty twenty. I, I mentioned something like it in terms of efficiency. It's it's not too hard to tell if you're sufficiently far away from a good system. Like we can identify when something is really sexist because. The farther away it is from being fair, the more obvious it becomes. Like, if you say, does basketball favor height? It's like, we just go watch basketball. Yeah. And it quickly becomes apparent that height is... But if we say, does height make you better at golf? It's like, huh, we'd have to look at a lot of golfers to like actually see whether the taller ones tend to... Because when you think of golfers, it's not... We know it's not a bunch of six foot eight guys. It's like maybe they're taller, you know. Maybe they're yeah. taller than average. Maybe the taller golfers are the ones that win, even if they're not tall. Maybe short people play golf, but the tallest short people right. win, right? Like, right? Like, so, yeah. like, I, I think, and I guess this is a good point to end on. Then, um, one of the weird paradoxes, and I think it's called Buridan's ass back in the old Greek, and I saw a random article mentioning it is. It can be harder to make a decision the more similar the options are. Mm. Like, it's a weird short circuit in your brain. Like, if I say, do you want to go to Wendy's or McDonald's? Well, like, realistically, those are not that different. Every second you spend thinking about it is, like, quickly making it worse than picking the worst one. So, like... And that kind of pops up a lot. It's like, which of these two exercise programs should I run? It's like, well... If you spend a month deciding which to run, the worst one was better. <laughs> yeah, because it was just better to like better to take that than. So I, I think that's part of where that the particular like feminism thing comes from. Like that Mott and Bailey is like we have fortunately gotten most people to a point where their beliefs are good enough 
that we're fighting over mostly stuff that's a little bit harder to, like, correctly suss out. Like, you would have to actually know how paternity courts, or, like, I'm sorry, like, family custody courts, you'd have to actually know about them to know whether they're, like, a little bit off-center. Yeah, so that reminds me, um, hopefully, maybe maybe we'll end here, maybe we'll keep going, who knows? <laughs> um, so, there's something Nietzsche said at the, um, I think it was in Twilight of the Idols, uh, but that like is a, he was attacking the idea of democracy. Mm. And he said it made people who actually have no um, interest, like they don't have no self-interest in actually mm. being involved in government, now have it be their civic duty mm. to do so. And actually the whole expectation that they can and should and it would be better for them if they did participate right. might itself be, or well, he wasn't saying might, he's saying right. it was a mistake. And in thinking about talking with people with philosophy, it's like, okay, well, or just anything in general where we're running into these issues, we, we've managed, maybe it might very well be the case that it wouldn't even be good for them to think in that way. Maybe it's like some people should specialize in thinking this way and other people, it's just better if they don't. Mm -hmm. And they're happy going to their job, spending time with their family, mm -hmm. going in and, you know, relaxing mm -hmm. on a vacation once yeah. a year or something. Like, like the one case where I, I think I agree with it is that like the, the whole political narrative from like probably when Trump announces election is probably like the right spot. Um, I, I would say it's sort of obvious to me that most people made themselves worse people the more they cared about it, including me, for sure. And, like, I'm excluding people from what I'm sort of thinking. I don't mean people who got motivated so they became engaged in, like, activism or, like, ran for office. I mean more that, like social media environment, the toxicity of yeah, the politics. Self-righteousness of everyone. Like, everyone. how many people were were thinking in a better way because they were involved in the tornado of poop? Because, like, how many people were really changing their minds at all? Like, so most people were spinning their wheels really, really hard in a way that wasn't sort of a flourishing as a human. The Zhang Zi kind of says something similar. Um, it's sort of Sunatomo in a way. Sunatomo is a samurai. And he said, like, look, don't teach young people about Zen Buddhism because they'll get the wrong idea <laughs> and they'll send them on the bad path. So just don't tell them about this. Wait right. till they're old. And uh, a similar idea with uh, Zhang Zi is like, look, it's okay if the peasant farmers are peasant farmers, mm -hmm. just let them be farmers and be happy. Don't try to freaking teach them yeah. how to cultivate their character and responsible conduct and how to be Confucian scholars. Stop. Right. Just don't just, they will, they will be happier if you just let them live their lives as they are. And there is something to that. I think that relates to this where it's maybe, you know, maybe it's just better not to have them dip their feet mm -hmm. in something that it's a, perhaps perhaps against their individual natures to be mm -hmm. involved in right? that's like the i think it's churchill right who, who was uh democracy is the worst system except for all the other ones is yeah, that churchill i think so like i think the distinction is and i'm like very pro democratic stuff and voting stuff but, like, I, there's a little bit of distinction, which is, like, do you like democracy? Do the gods like democracy because it's good? Or is democracy good because... It's like, like, if it were actually the case that we had the right monarch available, which we will never have the right monarch available, like, it's not an intrinsic thing. It's that I think we've learned historically, like... You're going to have corruption problems and lobbying problems and all these things. And it so far has seemed to work out much better when people are, in fact, voting. Like, very sort of firm in that. 
but it it can get weird when it turns into like why would you not treat the opinion of this guy and this Harvard economist the same? It's like I think we need to start with the assumption the Harvard economist probably knows more. Like we can move from there as needed, but like it, it's that um, or I guess the the more important objection is like the word democratic has been stretched farther than it works. It's been stretched to mean, like, there should be more comment from people who have no idea what they're talking about. Well, I think that actually isn't a stretch. I think that's a return to, like, Athens. Right. Which, I mean, if you look at the Republic, it is it has, in a sense, retrograded from Rome to Athens. Because it is less a Republic and, and more in the cultural mind, anyway. Perhaps not. And in terms of law. Mm -hmm. No, actually, in terms of law, right? The idea that not everyone can vote, mm -hmm. right? Like, um, that sounds terrible now mm -hmm. until you realize, like, well, wait a minute. The people who they restricted the vote owned the land. So, mm -hmm. like, if you get invaded, you have a vested interest to make sure that, like, there is a military. And, like, right. if you, you know, if you have a stake... Like in that that word, stake comes from mm -hmm. staking the goddamn ground yeah. where you were going to build a fence. Like right. so, so deep down, I think there, yeah, there were prejudices and people were disadvantaged based on things that weren't their fault. But that's always true, and I think it is. It was those measures were not evil. I think what they were were considerations like we don't want to end up like Athens mm -hmm. because Athens would just like football hooligans get all revved up, yeah. make some stupid election decisions, and then go to war. Like, <laughs> like the eternal, the eternally like funny like oligarchy problem yeah. or like any kind of elite ruling problem is like good luck ever setting it up so the elite leadership goes, you know, we've not been doing a great job. We should really bring in fresh blood and actually flesh out why we're not working very well. Like, that's like the funny dynamic. Is like, any oligarchy is like, just more of a bureaucracy. And like, is accountability always going to work better? No, but like, that, that's just what's weird. Is it's like, this is like the, the Plato problem is like picturing that what we're going to do is we're going to pick the good people to put in charge and they're going to keep picking their successors. And this will be a virtuous spiral instead of a vicious spiral. Right, guys? Yeah. Right? And, you know, I think that's a good place to wrap up because yeah. I, I just realized there's like, just remember everyone is human. Mm -hmm. They're all too human, right? They're too human for us to think. Well, thank you, Josh, for coming on. It's been an excellent couple of hours. Very fun conversation for sure. Um, for you listeners out there, if you like this, again, check out my website for more, wildislelit.com. Uh, you can find more podcasts there, my editing services, as well as my fiction, particularly my book, Wand Smoke Broken. It's a kind of weird uh, fantasy novel influenced by folklore and weird steampunk-ish kind of, but not really stuff. Just check it out. It's great. It's awesome. The first chapter's up there for free. All right, folks. I'll see you later.